We now proceed with our second speaker, Brian Nosek, a Professor of Psychology at the University of Virginia. As a psychologist, he investigates the gap between values and practices, such as when behavior is influenced by factors other than one's intentions and goals. But Brian is also co-founder and executive director of the Center for Open Science. Uh, the center manages the open science framework, a platform which helps researchers to manage and share their work more openly. And then more recently, the Center for Open Science also initiated a platform named OSF Registries, which enables researchers to document their research plans at the beginning of a study. In 2015, Brian Nosek was named one of nature's 10 and was included in the Chronicle for Higher Education's influence list. He's well known for all the work he has done to promote the central goals of the open science movement and to enable open reproducible research practices. Uh, Brian, uh, please take it away. Thank you very much, Kurt. I am, and thank you all for the invitation and for attending. Uh, I'm delighted uh, to be participating in this symposium. As Dorothy had mentioned, the, she was setting up the problem, doom and gloom about the challenges for uh, reproducibility and how to improve the credibility and integrity of research. Uh, and my focus will be uh, on the solutions. What can we do about this? How can we uh, improve uh, research practices and the research culture? And an important part of considering those solutions is to recognize that the challenges that Dorothy raised are an interdependence between individual factors and structural and system factors. The individual factors are that I as a researcher may not know that these behaviors are problematic. I may not know how to do uh, the right kinds of behaviors to improve the credibility or reproducibility of my research, right? So lack of awareness, lack of training. But even if I know the right uh, behaviors or what I can do to improve the credibility of my research, I may not recognize where it is that my conflict of interest as someone who uh, is rewarded for certain kinds of outcomes then creates biases in my own reasoning about my evidence to bias that research and ultimately reduce its credibility. So those unintended biases may influence how it is I carry out the research, even with the best of intentions. And that challenge is exacerbated by the structural components that actually create a reward system and incentives for me to leverage that rationalization that I may be doing uh, that changes the nature and the quality and the credibility of that work. So when we think about what is the change model to try to approach improving research practices, we situate the problem space is focused on this, is that the incentives for my success are focused on me getting it published, not on me getting it right. I want to get it right. I got into science because I want to figure things out. I like pursuing truth, but I have a career to maintain. I have a job to advance. I need promotion. I, all of the things that put me in terms of my careerist elements into the evidence as I am pursuing it and trying to obtain it. And so when we have misalignment between what's good for science and what's good for me, that's where we will create these conflicts that exacerbate the credibility challenges and create a dysfunctional culture. So our goal is to think about what is it that we can do to change those structural components so that individuals are rewarded for doing the behaviors that will enhance their credibility? And the really nice opportunity is that when you ask researchers about what they would like the scientific system to operate like, they endorse all of the qualities uh, that we would like to promote. Yeah, transparency, of course, like how could science operate without being transparent? Yeah, I, I'm into that, but I won't get rewarded for sharing my data. I, the culture you know, punishes me for showing the things that don't quite work and don't quite fit. So I can't do it. 
the system isn't supporting it. So there are lots of things that we could talk about as what are the changes to make to try to promote uh, greater credibility. We tend to focus on these three as the primary behaviors. Open data so that you can see the data that I obtained, uh, reanalyze it to see if you can obtain the same results, reproducibility, uh, or impose different analytic strategies on it uh, so that you can see if my findings are robust to the decisions that I made in how I analyze that data, or so you can combine it with other data to try to get aggregate and systemic evidence about the phenomena that I've investigated, or even apply new questions to those data that I didn't conceive of myself. Open materials so that you can have a better sense of how I obtained uh, that data, how I applied my inference or analytic strategies to that data to come up with some conclusions so that you can understand the basis of my claims more clearly. You can repeat them if you want to, and you can extend them. Oh, if you think that you, could, you would find something different in a slightly different context, you have uh, the materials of which I did that original research. And then third is pre-registration. The role, the key roles of pre-registration are one, to address publication bias as Dorothy described, right? Not everything gets published. Positive results are more likely to get published than negative results. So if I tell you all of the studies that I did by posting them to registries, you'd be able to in principle find the 37 studies I didn't put in the paper compared to the three that I did that happened to tell the, the same story and uh, assess that credibility. Likewise, pre-registration offers an opportunity to be very clear about the issue that De Groot raised, which is making clear when I'm testing hypotheses that I have in advance versus generating hypotheses by interacting with the data. Both of these exploratory and confirmatory approaches are very important for advancing science, right? We don't have the ideas all in advance laid out of how it is we will, uh, what it is we expect to discover and then just confirm those ideas. Much of our advancement comes by being surprised by outcomes, by that exploratory work that generates new possibilities that we never would have conceived. But the challenge is, as Dorothy described, when we start to mistake those discoveries that are by nature more uncertain as tests of hypotheses. Of course, I would have thought that that interaction and it's that subgroup and that analysis would have shown that. Of course, that, that aligns with my theory that I'm now generating on the fly. So that clarity will help with assessing the credibility of research. What all of these, if people did them at scale, if these were common practice, what all of them do is not itself necessarily increase the credibility of the research, but it allows what came up already in some of the discussion uh, that Kurt raised, which is self-correction. Science is not going to get it right the first time every time. We're studying things we don't know. Uh, it's science is hard. We're going to go down lots and lots and lots of false paths. That's fine. That's part of the process. The challenge is, is if we don't have an efficient self-corrective mechanism where we identify which paths are not actually promising and redirect our resources, is we will end up with an enormous amount of waste uh, by thinking we've discovered things that aren't actually there and failing to shift course uh, what, with follow-up evidence. So that's the big picture goal on what the solutions might be to help foster a more self-corrective process. So I just want to present uh, for the rest of the time an illustration of a theory of change to how it is we can shift not just individual behavior, but the overall systemic, the structural elements of that so that researchers can behave in line with their values and do more reproducible research. And this theory of change builds on the seminal work by Rogers uh, who, uh, who thought about diffusion of innovations. How is it that new technologies get adopted in social uh, communities? And this is the origin of the term, for example, in his work of early adopters, right? And the key idea from that work uh, that, that we apply is the notion that there are different motivations for people at different stages of the adoption process across a community that one has to address and pay attention to in order to obtain broad mainstream adoption. What innovators do, the people at the very front lines who just like trying new things, 
what they're interested in or what will get them to do new behaviors is very different than someone who is in the early or late majority, who is waiting to see what others do and whether I should now do that behavior as well. So at the, uh, the, at the bottom of this uh, figure are different factors that are interdependent uh, on helping to facilitate adoption of new behaviors. Making it possible is sufficient uh, for innovators to jump in. Oh, I can try this thing out. All right, I'll do it, see if it works. Making it easy uh, can help facilitate greater adoption by early adopters. Making it normative, showing that other people are doing it can facilitate adoption uh, into mainstream. Addressing those incentives can further mainstream. And then policies that make it required can bring along the laggards who just don't want to change, but they do want the grant or they do want the paper or they do want the job. So if it's required for those things, then I guess I'll do it. So I wanna unpack this a little bit with one uh, illustration of a, of a behavior, just to show how the research community collectively and uh, both in, independently and interdependently is fostering uh, this kind of uh, change through instantiation of these uh, change agents uh, at the bottom. And I'll do it in the context of pre-registration, although we could apply it for any kind of behavior uh, that we are trying to promote. Um, so at the first stage, making it possible, right? There have been a number of different registries that have emerged uh, that make it so that researchers can pre-register their work. There are ways that are customized for different fields or specific for uh, topics that will for people who are just interested, intrigued about the idea of pre-registration to now have a way to try to do it. Oh, let's see what happens if I do it. Those frontline innovators are folks that with just making it possible is sufficient because they like new things. They wanna try and test the vision of these possibilities. And so it's the, what the community does, what the norms are, what are rewards, that doesn't matter as much for those very early adopters. And what's a benefit is those early innovators who are trying out these new technologies provide a test bed to see if they meet their promise, uh, where there are challenges, what things need to be improved, so that you can move to the next stage of making it easy. Right? Making it easy by customizing to the needs that researchers have, by addressing the fact that researchers are busy, so adopting new behaviors is not going to be trivial. Uh, you have to, if you want effective adoption, integrate into their workflows so that it isn't disruptive to how they do their work, but rather facilitates it. And so a lot of pre-registration work now uh, in terms of infrastructure development and community development is about how do we customize the way that people pre-register, what they write down, how they write it down, what are, what are the things that you need to pay attention to and that kind of methodology gets built into the system for qualitative researchers, for cognitive modeling work, uh, for doing replications or, or fMRI, et cetera. That customization then helps as a guide uh, to researchers so that they can see the value of pre-registration, not as a bureaucratic burden, that's just, I have to fill out these forms because that's what they say is the right way to do things, but rather as a facilitative tool for research planning. I know better about what my study is, what it's for, why I'm doing it, how I'm gonna analyze my data because these structured guides help me think through uh, those problems. That making it easy can bring along those early adopters who are motivated by doing better research and not as prone to need the endorsement or the incentives by the community to initiate those new behaviors. And once those early adopters have some mass of evidence that they are doing these behaviors and that those behaviors are starting to work to some degree, they become the basis of promoting new norms. Uh, by making their behavior visible so that others in that community can see, oh, I see that there are other people doing this research like I'm doing it, or, and they're using pre-registration, so maybe I can do it uh, too, is a very important dissemination strategy in science because there isn't a top-down structure of this is how you do research. A lot of research practices are determined and supported by the norms of what research communities say. These are what people in my field do. This is how we do it. And so observing others doing those behaviors can help them facilitate that adoption. 
Likewise, as these behaviors become more common, engaging the academic debate, right? This is how researchers decide what's good and what's not, is, uh, is articulating a possibility and then pushing on it and poking at it and seeing where it survives and where it doesn't. And then of course, training is an important part of making things normative. To really push into the rest of the mainstream, have to address those incentives, right? It may be that I see others doing it, but I also know I'm still gonna get the papers then I'm gonna be the one that gets the job by not doing it because that seems like a pain in the butt. So why bother doing it? So reward, uh, you know, awards, just making prominent, this is a thing that it's valued and it's valued by institutional structures that one looks up to or one is dependent on. Funders play an important role uh, in making things rewarding. So for example, there are uh, funders that are partnering with journals to promote pre-registration uh, and give funding awards uh, for pre-registered research. And then publishing itself, right? Addressing the mechanism uh, of that reward and shifting what it takes to get a publication. Instead of, as was reviewed in Dorothy's talk, an emphasis on novelty and positive outcomes uh, and tidy evidence, one could instead adopt a publishing system that is focused on the quality of the methodology and the importance of the questions, regardless of what the outcomes are. And I'll say a little bit more about registered reports uh, toward the end as, as an example. And then finally, the requirements, right? Bringing everybody along uh, ultimately requires that there are standards. These are expectations, either strong expectations or actual requirements for what it is that we do in our domain of research. Now, one has to be very careful uh, with such requirements in science because the goal is not to constrain the types of questions or the types of evidence uh, that researchers will obtain because that as an open system has lots of benefits that researchers are motivated by ideas that they have and have opportunities to pursue it. But rather it's about the structural elements of what is it uh, that is participating in scientific discourse. Expectations about transparency that yes, there are many, many different ways we can be very ecumenical about the methodologies but really to be a participant in academic discourse requires that you share how you're doing it and what you're doing and how you got to the claims that you got to. Doing otherwise is really a different kind of thing uh, rather than science. Okay, so together those various activities can promote uh, new behaviors if they are well integrated across uh, the, the research community. So I just want to give a couple of examples uh, of evidence briefly just to illustrate uh, how it is that these occur in practice. And one is in that norms category I mentioned, those signals. If early adopters signal their behavior by, for example, getting badges at journals for when they meet those behaviors, sharing their data, sharing their material, pre-registering, then those signals may be impetus of starting to shift norms. People say, I, I don't know anyone that's pre-registered. But now I'm starting to see that there are people pre-registering in my field. And maybe that prompts me to look a little bit closer at it. So the journal Psychological Science uh, was the first journal to adopt badges. And it, it did so on January 1st, 2014. What I'm showing you here on the y-axis is the percent of articles in psych science, the black line, that reported having open data from 2012 up to 2014, before badges were adopted. You can see it's about 3% of the articles uh, in psychological science had open data during that time. And then there's four comparison journals that didn't adopt badges during this period. Psych science adopted badges January 1st, 2014, and the trend line goes like this. So within 18 months, uh, psychological science had about 40% of its articles where the researchers were reporting having shared their data and no change in the other journals. Now, over the last three years, it's about 80% of articles uh, in psych science have open data. Uh, and it's a stupid little badge, right? But it's not about the badge, right? The badge is simply a signal of a behavior that researchers in that community agree is a good behavior to do, but they, prior to this, didn't have evidence that other researchers wanted to do it, did do it, everything else. But as soon as you start to change a norm, it gets its own momentum especially when the behavior is a desired behavior because you see, oh, it's possible, others are doing it. Oh, it's desirable, the journal's acknowledging it. Uh, and I can do it because clearly others uh, in my field are doing it. So there's lots of potential for shifts uh, in behavior at scale when you can leverage norms effectively. 
The second example is to pull at registered reports, the, the incentive changing model about what it takes to get something published. This is a cartoon version of how science operates, right? You design a study, you collect and analyze the data, you write the report and then you publish it. Of course, that's not quite how it works because there's that big barrier of peer review uh, after the report's written before it's published. All of the incentives in this model are about make that report as beautiful as possible so that the peer reviewers will let it through, right? I need a positive result, I need a novel result, I need a neat and tidy story. But it's too late there if we're trying to address credibility. So the main change in registered reports is to move that initial stage of peer review to after the design stage rather than after the research is already done. So as an author, I submit my question, some preliminary data or evidence that this is a viable question to pursue, and my methodology, what I'm going to do to test uh, that question. And then the peer reviewers ask, is this an important question? And is this an effective methodology to test that question? And if they agree, then the journal gives an in-principle acceptance to me. We, we will publish this regardless of outcome if you follow through with what you said you were going to do. And then I do my work, and then I submit it at the report stage, uh, and the reviewers don't review, are the results exciting or what I expected them to be? They review, did you do what you said you were going to do? And do you have evidence that you did it at a high enough quality? And did you interpret the outcomes responsibly? And then it's published, right? Just that change dramatically changes the incentives for me as an author. It's no longer about the outcomes to get the reward I need. It's about asking important questions and designing effective methods to test it. And by doing that, it dramatically changes how it is researchers think about what it takes to be successful, what it is to get the reward that I need, publication to advance my career. And this has, in the initial evidence accumulated to date, some substantial impact on what gets published and the quality of that work in publishing it. So for example, uh, Anne Scheel and her colleagues looked at, does committing the register report model, committing to publication before knowing the results, address that key challenge that Dorothy raised, publication bias? And what you're seeing here is a comparison of standard reports, doing it the normal way of peer review after the results are known in the same journals, comparable articles to registered reports published uh, in those journals. And the standard reports show a pattern uh, that is very similar to every other analysis uh, like this, which is almost all the time our results, are, our hypotheses are supported. We get positive results consistent with what we expected uh, would occur uh, in a standard model, right? And maybe that's true. Maybe we already know all the answers to all the work and the research is just confirming uh, what we already know. But well, when we did when the when they looked at registered reports, what they found is only a little over forty percent of the hypotheses were supported when publication commitment was made prior to knowing what the outcomes would be. Right? This is the direct evidence of addressing publication bias. Uh, is an observational study, not randomized, uh, but it is the best evidence to date that this model uh, can help to address some of those biases uh, that are already evident. Now, a challenge, of course, is that when editors look at this, they say, oh, I don't know if I want to add registered reports to my journal then, because then I'll be publishing lots of unsupported results. And the reason there's a bias against this is because those are boring and no one will cite it. And this will not help the field or help me have a highly impactful journal. And we could say, well, boy, you shouldn't really be paying attention to citation impact. That's not the way to evaluate a journal. Nevertheless, that's the structural system that ed editors live in. And so we have to at least address the question, is it the case that registered reports are cited less than standard reports? And the evidence that we have so far is that the answer is no, they aren't less cited. Uh, so this is a similar kind of analysis, taking articles published a standard way, registered reports way from the same journals about published around the same time, and doing citation comparisons. Uh, 100 here would mean that the registered reports and standard articles are, are cited about the same amount. And above the line indicate that registered reports are cited more uh, than the comparison articles. Uh, so if anything, uh, registered reports cited a bit more, but you would 
mostly conclude here that there's, a, there's not much evidence of difference in these initial sample of registered reports. Now, there are a couple potential reasons uh, for this, right? One is that in the registered reports model, if the reviewers and editor agree before knowing the results that we need to know the results, then any outcome is a meaningful outcome. And so it isn't more boring or less interesting or less information. It is the information that that study revealed. And so that's citable. The second possible reason is that if you move the peer review process to the design stage, then you have more opportunity for expert input into improving that design. And because the incentives for me as the author is focused on making the methodology the best that I can, I have to pay really close attention to the methodology to make it as good as I can. And so it may be that the studies themselves are actually better studies in registered reports, more rigorous, more impactful, more informative uh, than they are in the standard model. And so we uh, did a, a study uh, to evaluate that. Uh, this in fact went in press yesterday uh, at Nature Human Behavior. Uh, so it will come out soon. It's already available as a preprint. Uh, but the <clears throat> goal of the project was to repeat the peer review process in this comparison between registered reports and the standard model to see if in fact the registered reports were more rigorous or less rigorous on different dimensions uh, than standard articles. And so we selected like the other uh, articles did, we have select from the same authors, a different article that wasn't a registered report as a comparison and some articles from the same journal on similar topics. Then we had peer reviewers review two of these articles uh, and they had to rate on 19 uh, quantitative outcome criteria uh, as they were doing these reviews. And so I'll just give you the brief summary result of that by showing you the 19 uh, outcome criteria here, which were evaluated at three different points in time. So in the uh, pinkish uh, color, uh, those are outcomes that were evaluated after the reviewers read the front matter, right? They read the introduction, initial studies, if there were initial studies, and the methodology of the proposed registered report uh, test, right? This final uh, test. Uh, and then they had to evaluate the, the rigor of the methods, quality of methods, how much will be learned, et cetera, et cetera. And what you're seeing uh, is that everything to the right of the dotted line is illustrating an advantage for registered reports compared to the standard model. And these are 95% uh, credible intervals, a Bayesian analysis. And you can see that, for example, methods, rigor and quality of methods it show a strong advantage for registered reports uh, compared to standard articles. And none of the criteria go in the reverse direction. Uh, there are some very modest uh, uh, differences or perhaps even uh, zero uh, on the creativity of the methods or the novelty of the question. Uh, but they never, uh, in this sample, uh, favor uh, standard articles over registered reports. Then the reviewers got to read uh, all of the study outcomes, what happened uh, when they did the studies, right? And now there's a lot more negative results in those registered reports than in the standard. Uh, and nevertheless, registered reports on every single criterion uh, show a stronger performance uh, than the comparison articles, even though those comparison articles are from the same authors uh, or published in the same journals, presumably with similar evaluation criteria. And then they read the final uh, material, the abstract and, and judged the paper as a whole. And again, every single criterion shows from little uh, to substantial favor, favoring of registered reports over the standard model. Now, I don't want to over-exaggerate uh, these findings and say everything uh, should now be registered reports. This is one study. It's a sample uh, of uh, registered reports and comparison articles. It is not a randomized trial. But what it does do is prompt uh, a rationale for continuing to advance research and investment uh, in registered reports to see how far it can go. Inevitably, there will be identification of places where uh, there are limits uh, or constraints on its applicability, uh, costs that are unrecognized. And so it isn't obvious uh, that register reports should become the de default model of publication. But I suspect that both the standard model and register reports will both play an important role uh, in uh, research process and scholarly communication uh, for the foreseeable future uh, based on results like this. As you're listening to that model, you might be thinking, wait, that that sounds like grant reviews. Why, <laughs> like, 
Isn't that the same thing? And yes, in fact, it is or could be the same thing. And so what this creates as an opportunity is to start to address the fact that it's not just the publishing system that needs to change these structural components, but also the funders and the institutions and societies. So with register reports, we have this wonderful opportunity to generate collaborations between journals and funders to have a single review process. Authors submit their paper of proposed work and a budget. If it passes peer review, the journal commits to publishing it, the funder commits to funding it. Everybody wins in this model, right? Authors say, wait, I submit once and I get the money and the paper. Okay, I'm game for that. Journals say, oh, I'm gonna get high quality research uh, at my journal that's funded. Great, that sounds awesome. And funders say, wait, you mean most, maybe all of the research that we fund will get published? Instead of much of it being entirely wasted because no one ever sees it, it gets in a file drawer and we have no way to track it. Okay, that sounds great. And all of the research in the end, if all of this earlier work uh, is reliable, is better research. Uh, so there have been uh, maybe six or seven of these uh, as pilots uh, where we've helped find, uh, you know, match make between journals and funders to do this. And now we have an NSF uh, grant to evaluate the effectiveness uh, of these uh, over time in helping to shift uh, research cultures by having multiple uh, institutional or stakeholder agents uh, promoting new practices within different fields. So I think this is a very promising uh, direction for registered reports. So let me close uh, now that we're at uh, time just to illustrate that, that change is occurring. Uh, these issues have been front and center in academic debate uh, in various parts of the research community of how can we do better, uh, how should we change. And a lot of that work, uh, as Dorothy described, has been driven by grassroots efforts, researchers saying we need to change ourselves and institutional uh, agents increasingly becoming more and more active uh, in changing their own norms, incentives, and policies. This is just one way of illustrating some change, which is the use of the open science framework. The data is most readily available to us is the use of the services that we maintain. And this is just the number of users uh, using the OSF for sharing their data or materials or pre-registering their research or, sh or sharing preprints uh, over time. It's well over 300,000 now. Likewise, the number of studies registered uh, on the OSF is showing uh, nonlinear increases year by year, and that's likewise well over 60,000. And open science isn't just the actions of the researchers generating uh, the research. It's also for the people who are consumers uh, of that research. So the number of people that are visiting the OSF, and I'm sure other services like the OSF are seeing similar numbers, has been increasing dramatically over, year over year. Uh, and just last year, more than 3 million files were added to the OSF. More than 2 million of those, or about 2 million of those, uh, were made publicly available. You can use the OSF privately for things that need to stay private, but make whatever public you can make public. And they're downloaded at increasing rates year over year. So the contents of stuff being shared is getting shared in a way that's more meaningful than just, yeah, I made it available, but will anyone ever look? So all of these are positive indicators of the research culture starting to shift. But of course, a full shift in the research culture is a hard problem because we have to solve the coordination problem, right? There are lots of independent agent actors uh, in science. There is no top-down influence that will change them all. So we need to assess, address the fact that institutions have their own hiring and promotion policies, publishers have their uh, what standards for what gets into their journals. Funders have their standards for what uh, gets published. And societies play a big role in awards and norms uh, within their subdisciplines. And so if we're really going to shift researchers' behavior in a sustained way, we need all of those actors to be addressing uh, the shared values that we have in how they manifest uh, their various incentives and, and rewards. And with that, I will end uh, for today. Here are some links to some of the things that I talked about. And if you snap a, a screenshot, the slides are available at that link uh, at the bottom. I'm happy to address questions and discussion as we have opportunity. So thanks very much for your time and attention. Uh, thank you, Brian, uh, yeah, for a uh, yeah, solution-oriented uh, talk. Uh, yeah. 
of course, what you suggest uh, with regard to pre-registrations uh, that, that is common in, or might be common in some fields, but of course, a lot of fields do not uh, um, uh, use pre-registration of the research project. And how do you think that could be introduced in, in other fields? Uh, yeah, for example, the humanities would be perhaps the most difficult uh, uh, example. And how also can you then, you, you mentioned already at the end of your talk, how you could uh, convince funding agencies and publishers. Uh, yeah. But I'm, I'm particularly interested in, of course, uh, those fields that are not using it at, at this point. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And there, there are two uh, key issues with that. One is, is getting communities to try it uh, that haven't tried it. And a second is evaluating whether it works uh, across these different methodologies. So qualitative research, which is, uh, has a strong representation in the humanities and other uh, social sciences is, is a great case example. Uh, there are interesting scholarly debates uh, that are really fabulous uh, of can qualitative research benefit from pre-registration? And the real answer is we don't know yet, uh, but there are real good theoretical rationales to justify why it would in certain kinds of cases in certain ways. And now there is a small community of innovators who said, well, let's design a form. Let's try it out. Let's see what happens uh, when we make these commitments uh, in advance. And then we'll see. That's science at its best, right? This is so wonderful of saying, okay, we don't know how it will work. We're gonna try it out. We'll, we'll get some data and then we'll see uh, and refine our approach uh, based on that. And so that's really, I think the strategy is to engage research communities in meta research about their own practices and encouraging uh, trying out these behaviors and assessing what the impact is. For us organizationally as the Center for Open Science, the way we're trying to sort of help catalyze that is working by near, with near neighbors. So there are communities that do have substantial now uh, pre-registration behavior. In psychology, it's become quite popular in some subdisciplines, And so we can leverage proximity uh, as a way to try to encourage adoption of pre-registration. You know, will it get to, uh, you know, analytic chemistry uh, and other fields, I don't know. And right now we don't know to what extent it would have benefits, but that's the great thing of testing these out is, is that it, it will expand in incremental ways uh, rather than just say, okay, now we're all gonna do this, which who knows what impact that would have. Right. One of the things I, uh, when I talked with, with uh, researchers in my role as a university librarian and as an organization uh, that is trying to support a number of these things, you're now being confronted, of course, with open access, with yeah. um, having to f uh, um, make their data open and fair. Uh, they have to uh, deal also with making their software, their coding open. Uh, now you, you, you're telling us you have to pre-register. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So the reward, the reward system is being looked at uh, uh, yeah. in the Netherlands, but in other countries also. So a lot is coming, um, is happening. And a number of these researchers are saying, well, this is uh, causing so much bureaucracy. It is limiting us. Uh, yeah. And also um, the costs are quite, are rising because all of these infrastructures, support, training, you name it, has to be uh, developed and maintained. How do you look at, at this? Uh, yeah. yeah, these are very reasonable things for people to raise as concerns because they are the pragmatics uh, of how is it that we translate and improve our practices. And of course, we can look at them in one way and say, well, there are lots of things that we do and we recognize as necessary. Like we, we take on the burden of randomization when we can randomize because we recognize that's better for making better inferences. So some of these practices, one can build them into, well, that's just how we do research in order to do the best possible research. But sometimes it's not obvious whether they are going to have those benefits. And some of the behaviors don't have a direct benefit for the quality of my research, at least that I can see, right? Sharing my data, it might improve the quality of my research because I know I have to share the data. And so I may be more fastidious or attentive to potential problems. But it may just be like, well, yeah, I'm, I'm helping other people's research. I'm not helping me uh, in that behavior. 
So I think the key for a lot of this is one to embrace incrementalism, right? Incrementalism is not a bad word <laughs> in science. It's a great word. Uh, it's a great word because we can go step by step and then course correct uh, based on uh, for evidence, but also for new behaviors uh, in adopting things to figure out how to best uh, manage it in a productive and effective way in our work. And then the second is that institutions and service providers have to work on that make it easy step, right? If we're not attentive to how researchers do their work and adapt these things in ways that actually make their work better, right? That's the easiest sell, right? If our pre-registration service is something that a researcher goes through and instead of feeling at the end, God, that was a lot of work. If, the, if we can get them to say, wow, I really am confident in my study now, or wow, that helped me do my work, then there's nothing that you need to sell them on. What do you mean not do this? This is making my work better. Like, why wouldn't I do this? And then the last part is credit. Uh, and yes, there's a big challenge of, well, if it's all about papers and those papers reporting novel results, and I could get 12 and now I can only get six per year, what's gonna happen? You know, the, the external agents of evaluation need to change, but also we need to change what one gets credit for. Uh, so sharing data should be something that gets credit. That is a scholarly artifact in addition to the paper itself. And I've shared data sets that other people have written dozens of papers from. Wow, that should be something that people say, wow, Brian's really good at sharing data and he's generated really interesting data that others have made use of. And that is part of my scholarly contribution. So there's lots of work to do there, uh, but there's lots of opportunity to do it so that this can be, uh, uh, can be adopted with, saying without cost is not the right phrase, but in a soft landing way that actually is aligned with what people are hoping to adapt to rather than having this and then just trying to figure out how to survive. Right, right, okay.